Hello and welcome to today's lecture. Today we will take a look at the Riemann-Roch theorem, which is an important theorem for projective curves and deals with zeros and poles of functions on projective curves. We will certainly not get to the proof of the theorem, but we'll hopefully see uh, what it means. But in order to get to the theorem, we need to go through a number of concepts that might seem strange at first, but again, hopefully they will become clear later on. So, as I said, the theorem deals with zeros and poles of rational functions on projective curves. And the background is that on a projective variety, as we know, there are no non-constant regular functions that are defined globally over the whole variety. So we must allow poles. And uh, the uh, functions we get are sort of rational functions, f divided by g, and we must allow points x such that g of x is equal to 0. Otherwise, we'll only have the constant functions. But having a pole is kind of a bad behavior, so we want to control the poles of rational functions in some fashion. So the problem is to determine the size of the set of rational functions having prescribed poles of prescribed multiplicity. So say I take my P1, if that's the most simple example of a projective curve, and then I have a point x equals 0 and x equals 1, choosing some affine coordinates. And say that at x equals 0, I require my function to have a pole of order at most 5. And here I want it to have a 0 of order at least 2, for example. So the question is, how many such functions, such rational functions, do there exist? And the answer will be the dimension of some vector space. And this is determined in terms of the Riemann-Roch theorem through the genus of the curve and some differential data. So the Riemann-Roch theorem will tell us that the dimension of the vector space we're looking at, or the number of such functions, if you wish, has to do with the genus and the tangent or differential cotangent uh, data of the curve. The Riemann-Roch theorem exists in an analytic setting as well, in complex analysis. And there, the genus of a curve is clear. But here, we are dealing with the algebra geometric version of it, so we need to define such things as the genus. So let's start with divisors. And throughout this lecture, we will work with an irreducible projective curve, C. So what is a divisor on C? A divisor on C is a formal sum of points uh, on the curve with integer coefficients. So for example, we can have some curve with two points P1 and P2 on them, and we take D equals 3P1 minus 6P2. That is a divisor. And the idea in the back of our mind is that somehow there is some function having a 0 of order 3 at p1 and a pole of order 6 at p2. But a divisor is more general than that. It is just such a formal sum. And the integer np, the coefficient of the point p, is called the order of the divisor at this point. And if we sum all these orders, then we get the degree of the divisor. And so that is an integer. So for example, in our previous example, it would be 3 minus 6, which is minus 3, the order of the divisor. And so these divisors form an abelian group. The addition is simply that you take the sum of NPP plus the sum of n p prime p equals the sum of n p plus n p prime p. And zero is simply yeah, the sum of zero p. So uh, 
this is the abelian group of all divisors on C. It is clearly abelian because the addition is based on addition of integers. And so the main example, the principal example of this construction is associating, as I mentioned briefly, a divisor to any rational function. So to give you an example, let us look at this in an affine setting. Affine setting. So let me for now take a1 and not p1. And let me take the rational function, say x to the power 6 divided by x minus 1 to the power 7. So to this, I want to associate the divisor d, which is 6 times the point 0 minus 7 times the point 1. I'm drawing brackets around the points so that we don't confuse them with the numbers 0 and 1. So this is the point 0 on the affine line and the point 1 on the affine line. And this function has a 0 of order 6 at 0 and the pole of order 7 at 1. This is why I want the 6 and the 7. Um, if you were dealing with a projective setting, we have to bear in mind the point at infinity. So this 0 would correspond to some pole at infinity and vice versa. This is why in the examples I am using the affine setting because the ideas come across easier that way. To make this precise and to get more tools to work with our functions, we will do a bit of algebra. So we will look at discrete valuation rings. So what is a discrete valuation ring? A discrete valuation ring is a local domain R whose maximal ideal is principal. So local means that there is a unique maximal ideal. Domain means that the ring is non-trivial and has no zero divisors. And the additional uh, remark, a requirement is that the maximal ideal, say M, is generated by one element, say t. And any generator of this maximal ideal is called a uniformizer. So why are these rings called discrete valuation rings? Because of the following. So if you take an Ethereum local domain R, call its maximal ideal M, and the residue field R mod M, call it K, then the following three conditions are equivalent. First is R is a discrete valuation ring, as we just defined. Second, the dimension of the k vector space m mod m square is equal to 1. And third, there is a discrete valuation from the non-zero elements of the fraction field of R to the integers, such that the ring R itself uh, has zero and all the elements with non-negative values. We will see the formal definition of discrete valuations on the next slide. But first, as an example, let me mention that the local ring of a regular point on a curve is a discrete valuation ring. This is clear from property two because at the uh, requirement for regularity or smoothness is that the dimension of this vector space is the dimension of the variety. And since the variety is a curve, the dimension is 1, so this is uh, clear. The equivalence of these three conditions is left as an exercise. So what is a discrete valuation? A discrete valuation on a field K is a group homomorphism from the multiplicative group of the field to the integers. This means that if I take v of x, y, I get v of x plus v of y. So this is under multiplication and this is under addition. In addition, I require that there is some well behavior with respect to the sum. The value of the sum is greater than or equal to the minimum of the two values. So what is an example of this? Well, if R is a discrete valuation ring with maximal ideal M 
uh, generated by one element t. Then let's denote by ord f the largest r such that f is contained in m to the power r. So f is an element of the ring r and we denote this in this way. So pause and think what this means. Well, we can write f uniquely as alpha times t to the power r for a uniquely defined r such that alpha is invertible in the ring r. And so this r is exactly the value. So, so uh, some alpha t6 has order 6 and so. And so this is the way to define it on the ring r. Then we extend it to the field of fractions by saying that the order of f uh, divided by g is the order of f minus the order of g. And if r is the local ring of our um, irreducible projective curve c at a smooth point p, then we get the valuation ord p on the fraction field kcp. So, for example, ord at x equals 0 of, say, x6 divided by x minus 1 to the power 7. Again, I am taking an affine example because x to the power of 6 and I mean these are regular functions on the affine line and, and um, so this will be 6 and uh, in the local ring x minus 1 is invertible so this is 1 divided by x minus 1 to the power of 7 times x to the power of 6 so this is our t this is the generator of that maximal ideal and this is invertible in that local ring so that is the general idea illustrated in an affine case. So if we have a rational function in Kc, we say that the function has a zero at p if its order at p is positive and a pole at p if the order at p is negative. And we call it regular at p if the order is non-negative. So you might want to pause and think of um, a projective example of these things and how they look in that setting. So this brings us now to the notion of uh, a principal divisor that will make precise what we wanted to do earlier. So first a proposition that the number of zeros and of poles of any function, uh, rational function phi in kc, that is not identically zero, is finite. And if phi has no poles, then phi is constant. Well, the rough idea is that on affine patches, we'll be able to write this as f divided by g. Both of these have a finite number of zeros, so this will have a finite number of zeros and poles. And if it has no poles, then we know it's a regular function, so it has to be constant if it's a globally defined regular function. And so now assume that the curve C is smooth and take a rational function on C. Then we define the following divisor. The divisor will... So remember, a divisor is a formal sum of points. And now as the order, we take the order of the function at that point. So this works if f is not zero, not identically zero, and we define the ord at p of f to be infinity if f is identically zero, or in fact, if and only if f is zero everywhere. So this gives us really a function from kc to z union is infinity. That is just an added convention. So this we call the divisor of f. And 
A divisor of this form, a divisor for which we can find a function f such that this holds, is called a principal divisor. And the principal divisors form a subgroup of the group of divisors, and since that group is abelian, this subgroup will be a normal subgroup. So we can look at the quotient group, and we can express it. So what does it mean to be in the quotient group? Well, so we call two divisors linearly equivalent if their difference is principal, and the quotient group of these equivalence classes the quotient group, which will be the group of these equivalence classes, is called the divisor class group, CL of C, or the Picard group, PIC C. There is a more general definition of the Picard group, but in this setting, this is what it is. Finally, we can put an order on divisors. So, uh, if a divisor is uh, a sum of n p times p, and another divisor is a sum of n p prime uh, times p, then we say that d is greater than or equal to d prime, precisely when all these um, uh, orders are superior in d to those in d prime. This defines a partial order on the divisor class group. And we call the divisor effective if all n p are positive or z. Then we will define this object. So first let's look at it and then let's see what it means intuitively. So for each uh, divisor we set L of d to be the set of all functions, rational functions on the curve, such that the divisor of this function is greater than or equal to minus d. So for example, if our d is say 3p1 minus 6p2, then minus d is minus 3p1 plus 6p2. And so saying that the divisor of the function is greater than or equal to minus d means that we are allowing a pole of degree at most 3 at p1 and we require a zero of degree at least 6 in p2. The proposition is that this is a k-vector space of finite dimension Ld and it is determined up to isomorphism by the linear equivalence class of D. The first part I leave as an exercise to see that it is determined by the linear equivalence class, what does it mean? So, assume that I have a different divisor, d prime, that is linearly equivalent to d. So it's d plus div g for some function g. So then I want to create an isomorphism from L of d prime to L of d. And the claim is multiplication by g precisely affords this isomorphism. Why is that? Well, so if div f is greater than or equal to minus d prime, then this is if and only if div f g, which is div f plus div g, is greater than or equal to minus d prime plus div g. And this is exactly minus d. So I get that these two are the same. So intuitively what this means is that the poles of f are controlled by d, as I said. So where d has some high, a point with a high enough order, then we are allowing a, a pole, vice versa. So we want to determine the dimension of this vector space. This will tell us how many functions, in some sense, have their pole behavior uh, controlled by the divisor d. And that is what we will do using the Riemann-Roch 
theorem in terms of other properties of the curve.